Okay. Well, welcome everybody to the 2022 Master Liberal Arts Capstone Forum. We're going to have four wonderful presentations from four recent graduates in the program who are joining us from uh, hither and yon and in map their busy day work and um, life and kids. So it should be fun to hear some of their work and let them share some of the stuff that they learned and developed and explored in their own final capstone project. Most of you know a little bit probably about the MLA program that are here tonight. Just remember it's a kind of really exciting, dynamic, flexible, interdisciplinary graduate program where students create their own unique concentration, find courses that fit that concentration, that fill a need or an interest for them to pursue intellectually, academically, even potentially uh, influence what they do professionally. And that's really exciting. And the capstone is the way that you sort of tie things together at the end from the different courses and the different discipline areas you study, the different methods you learned, and you explore a, a, a sort of research question or a project from more than one angle, and you apply different disciplinary lenses to it and come out with a really exciting, fun, final written work um, as the last uh, element for required graduation um, for the Master of Liberal Arts. So it's really fun because every year we have anywhere between 25 and 35 students do the program and finish up whereas we have about 100 and something active students because people do it part-time and full-time. But of those 35 students that graduate in any given year, the range of topics is extraordinarily diverse, not just in terms of topics, but also in terms of the angle of approach that people took to explore their research. We have people doing things that are a mix of social science and hard sciences. We have people in, investigating the lab sciences, but through the lens of ethics and philosophy. We have people exploring literature and history we have people exploring uh, approaches to education, but thinking about them with the I, um, information they get from urban studies courses and philosophy courses. So it's really a wonderful dynamic program. And the students you'll hear from um, did four really wildly different things. And I think they'll really put, uh, show how the MLA program gives you a great opportunity to create the degree in the program that's right for you and do something that's really ultimately both rewarding and can be fun. I think if it's not fun, don't do it quite frankly. Um, and ultimately can be your degree as opposed to a degree that somebody else maps out for you. So I'm gonna launch into this right away. Uh, thanks for joining us um, and introduce Tom Stanley. He's a digital media specialist in Penn's Office of Development and Alumni Relations. He's had that role for three and a half years, assisting with university's advancement efforts through the creation of videos and photos, web stories, social media content, and email communications. Before that, he spent close to eight years at the uh, Marketing Communications Office at the Penn Museum, where he worked his way up from volunteer to full-time public relations and social media manager position. Um, he earned his undergraduate degree in 2007 from Susquehanna University with a major in broadcasting and a minor in creative writing and philosophy. And he lives in Glenside with his wife, Bernadette, and his two daughters, Cassidy and Shannon. His spring 2022 MLA capstone was Seeing the Forest for the Trees using Instagram to examine visitation at Philadelphia's Wissahickon Valley Park. It's all yours, Tom. All right, thanks, uh, thanks, Chris. Um, so folks, I, uh, I'm i a bit of a storyteller. Uh, and so um, the presentation I have right now is gonna start sort of at the beginning of my entry into the uh, MLA program and we're gonna work our way towards my, uh, my capstone. Um, so uh, I got on board with the MLA program back in 2017. Um, I'd been working at uh, the Penn Museum in marketing communications for about five years at that point, uh, at least in, uh, in a full-time um, capacity. And I knew that I had tuition benefits available to me that I wasn't using. Um, I knew that having a graduate degree from Penn uh, could be very helpful for advancing my career. But beyond that, a variety of my museum colleagues were Penn faculty members um, who worked in archaeology and anthropology. And their work was something that I wanted to understand a little better, especially being marketing communications guy. It was my job to know what was going on uh, with at the museum and the people who uh, who work who worked it and um, you know who made the place run. So the MLA program offered an opportunity to do that in a classroom setting, um, but it also left the door open for me to pursue other fields of study. Um, for example, I do a lot of writing in my line of work, and so uh, I wanted to build my skills in that area as well. But because I was working full time, I felt like I could only handle one course at a time, and the MLA program's you know malleable structure allowed me to do a fall course and a spring course each year, uh, with a plan to finish the program after five years. 
So my first three classes, um, I took a writing course with Kitsy Watterson that focused on conducting interviews, which was something that had always interested me. I studied cultural heritage and conflict with Brian Daniels, who helps to run the uh, Penn Cultural Heritage Center at the Penn Museum. And I took, took a digital archaeology course with Peter Cobb in the museum's uh, Center for Analysis of Archaeological Materials. And one of my main takeaways at this point was just how much work went into each of these courses. Um, they, retired a, they required a, a ton of reading, lots of writing, and really a big shift in my weekly planning, especially considering it had been a full 10 years since I had finished my undergrad. Um, but working on campus made it more manageable since I could kind of just stroll over to the classroom whenever my workday was finished. Then my wife and I uh, were expecting our first child in the spring of 2019, so I chose to take advantage of one of the program's online courses. Uh, I knew I was going to be off campus for a month during my parental leave, and since I live up in Glenside, uh, about an hour's commute from Penn, an online course made a lot of sense during that period. Um, so I took a philosophy course called Mind, Body, and World with Gary Papura. I minored in philosophy during my undergrad, so this was something that interested me, and it allowed me to add some variety to my coursework in the MLA program. Uh, I stayed online for the following semester when I took academic writing and research design with Chris Raberman. Remember that course name, academic writing and research design. This was the single most valuable course I took throughout the whole program, not just because it taught me a lot about making my academic writing more accessible, but also because that's how it was in that class that I developed the proposal for my capstone project, which was what would, would focus on Wissahickon Valley Park here in Philadelphia and the rapidly rising visitation that that park had been experiencing. Now, if you're not familiar with that park, it's this stunning 1800 uh, acre space in Northwest Philadelphia with gorgeous hiking trails and a history that goes long beyond the uh, arrival of Europeans in this area. I encourage you to check it out if you've never visited before. Um, so Chris Pastore uh, recommended my next course, which was Mapping Philadelphia with Paul Farber. It focused on Philadelphia history and was probably my favorite course in the whole program. Um, but of course, COVID hit halfway through that semester. And so from then on, all the rest of my MLA, MLA courses were online courses. So it was helpful that I had already had some experience in that setting already. Um, I enrolled next in a course called Geographic Information Systems. This was not an MLA course, but it was available to us as an uh, to me as an L MLA student. And my intention here was to find interesting ways of applying knowledge of geographic information systems to my uh, capstone project. Unfortunately, I realized after one class period that I was not in the right headspace for this class. Um, the content was confusing to me. The rest of the students seemed much more at ease with the content than I felt like I was. And at this point, we were only six months into the, into the pandemic. It was still a very stressful time. And so between that and my responsibilities at work and as a father, I sort of swallowed my pride um, and switched out of that class into a creative writing class, um, which was still plenty of work and very much applicable to, a, applicable to my interests. But this way, I didn't have to spend the whole semester stressed out and fumbling to understand a field of study that I really didn't need to take on. Um, I had to swallow my pride a little bit, but it was the right, right choice, and sometimes that's just what you need to do. Um, my eighth and ninth courses in the program were on uh, a course on natural philosoph philosophy with Karen Detlefson, who is now the vice provost of education here at Penn, and a journalistic writing course uh, instructed by Kristen Martin. And by this point, I learned and I had learned an incredibly valuable tactic for course selection, which I'll share with you now. And that is to identify the three or four courses that you're interested in taking and email the instructors and ask them for a copy of their syllabus. Um, different courses taught by different instructors can sometimes require vastly different amounts of work. And if I was on the fence about taking one course or another, doing this allowed me to weed out the courses where the syllabus called for what I felt was an unnecessary amount of work and time and energy. Um, one professor sent me a syllabus that called for three or 400 pages of book reading per week and writing assignments on top of that. And I was realistic at this point about how much work I was able to put into each class given my other responsibilities outside of school. So this way I was able to enjoy the coursework that I took on rather than be being totally overwhelmed by it for what would have been the same amount of course credit. Um, if it's not fun, don't do it. Um, 
So this past spring, uh, and now we're getting the capstone finally, uh, my final course enrollment was in the capstone seminar with uh, Nancy Watterson and Michael Murray. Um, the capstone seminar uh, is optional, but it provides sort of a structured approach to completing uh, the capstone project. Um, Michael Murray served as a reader for my project, as did Kristen Martin, um, who, uh, as I mentioned, she was my instructor for the previous semester journalistic writing course. She made a great um, uh, advisor for this capstone project because she's a, a writer and um, her notes on my project throughout the, the course of the semester were extremely helpful. Um, and uh, so starting off with that capstone proposal that I'd created in Chris Raberman's academic writing and research design course, that made all the difference in the world. Um, I knew what I wanted to study and how I wanted to study it. I had already done a ton of historical research and literature review. So I had set myself up in a big, big way. Um, one woman in my capstone seminar, a classmate of mine, she told me, she told us that she had not taken that course and she really regretted it. Um, when we turned it <laughs> our first draft. My, my first draft was about 35 pages long. Hers was about 10 pages long. Um, so, uh, you know, just to illustrate how, how much of a head start that course gave me. Um, at this point, I'm going to share my screen and uh, show a couple of slides. Um, can everybody see this? Yes. Good. Um, so my capstone focused on rising visitation at Wissahickon Valley Park. Um, and since my, uh, since my career focuses heavily on um, digital media, uh, the main goal of my project was to try to use social media as a way of understanding the park's visitation on both quantitative and qualitative levels. So my strategy here was to analyze social media posts that were related to Wissahickon Valley Park visitation and look at how frequently they appeared and when and what kinds of activities were being depicted or described in those posts and then compare that data to visitor data collected through more traditional methods, um, uh, you know, on-site surveys and um, uh, radar trackers uh, at trailheads and that kind of thing to see how closely my research lined up with the metrics tracked uh, by traditional methods. Um, so I focused my project on Instagram because there were there was already some precedent for using social media to measure visitation at other geographic locations, but those typically involved using Twitter and Flickr and not so much using Instagram. So I spent some time browsing through Instagram to find public posts related to Wissahickon Valley Park uh, by using hashtags and location tags to guide my search. Um, and this slide shows the, uh, the hashtags and location tags that I ended up using to, uh, to track my uh, research. And on the right hand side, you see the um, activities that I was co uh, searching for, um, which range anywhere from uh, artificial sightseeing, which, you know, means basically looking at man made structures, um, to uh, exploring public art in the park, mycology, uh, you know, exploring mushrooms and that kind of thing. Um, there's a lot that people do in the park. And so I wanted to get a really, uh, you know, robust sense of why people were going there. Um, and uh, so once I identified the most frequently used hashtags uh, related to Wissick and Valley Park visitation, I tracked their use in, um, uh, in public posts for the entire year of uh, 2021. Um, it took a lot of time. Um, <laughs> and literally that meant searching on each one of those tags and then scrolling through the entire year and counting how many times uh, I, those uh, hashtags or location tags were appearing throughout the year. Um, a lot of scrolling, uh, a lot of sitting around and um, brain kind of going numb. Uh, it was almost fortunate that I got COVID uh, during the course of my, um, my studies because I got to just lock myself away in a back room and just plow through the research, uh, um, though I wouldn't wish that really on anybody. Um, <laughs> then, uh, so then I took a selection of posts um, and uh, I analyzed them in terms of what sorts of activities were being illustrated in the posts, photo or video or described in the caption. So this slide that we're looking at right here, um, you can see uh, from the picture, there's dog walking going on, obviously. And because of the lush green setting that this photo is taken in, um, 
you, uh, I also log this as natural sightseeing going on. Um, but then if you look at the caption, there's that little, um, that little green emoji, uh, you know, the, the leaf with the leaves on it, the, the, the little sprout that also says to me that this person is out here doing some natural sightseeing. And you can see that they're um, on a run. So those three metrics, dog, dog walking, running, and natural sightseeing is what I would pick, what I would log for this post. And then I'd continue and do the next post. Um, once I had all that data gathered, I compared it to on-site uh, visitor data that had been collected and shared with me by staff at the parks stewardship organization, the Friends of the Wissahickon, to see if they lined up in any way. Um, and I was pleasantly surprised uh, by how closely some of my data lined up with theirs. Um, looking specifically at the location tag Wissahickon Park, um, you can see here that uh, up here is the on-site counter data, and then beneath it is the Wissahickon Park um, data that I collected. And it's strikingly similar in a lot of ways. Um, Sundays are the, mo the busiest day of the week. Uh, Saturday is closely behind that. Um, the weekends make up about 40% of visits. And um, you know, it, it was really kind of uh, surprising how closely a lot of these, uh, these numbers end up turning out. Uh, this was by far the most frequently used um, uh, location tag. And I noticed that as I looked at other location tags that were less commonly used, they tended to show results that didn't quite line up as well. Um, that's mainly because they would often be appearing more sporadically. You'd go a few days uh, without them, without any posts going up using that location tag. And then all of a sudden on a Tuesday, somebody's going in and using it three or four times. And that tended to skew the trends for their use. Um, but uh, but this, this uh, Wissahickon Park location tag, I found it to be really, really useful. Um, and uh, hashtags showed some results that were somewhat similar to the on-site data, but the problem with those is that people tend to jam multiple hashtags into single posts, sometimes 20 or 30 or more. And um, those posts aren't always guaranteed to actually be related to Wiss Wissahickon Valley Park visitation. Sometimes people are just using with hashtag Wissahickon as a marketing um, ploy. Uh, but with location tags, you can only use one of those per post. So those tended to be a little more reliable. And in terms of qualitative data, at this point I can stop sharing. Um, in terms of qualitative data, um, what people were doing in the park, why they were visiting uh, based on the content of their posts. This took a lot more time to track and record um, than just counting one post, one post, one post. Uh, so I chose a set of 100 posts for each tag from various points throughout the year to use as my data set. And I'd study those posts and I'd log in a spreadsheet, you know, dog walking, hiking, et cetera, et cetera, based on what's going on in each post. And I made a few mistakes with this part of the study. Um, for one, the values that I was searching on didn't align perfectly with the values studied in the visitor survey that the friends of the Wissahickon shared with me. I was looking for some activities that they weren't looking for and vice versa. Um, and additionally, my choice to study 100 posts from each tag was a little flawed because some tags were using being used far more frequently than others. Um, and so uh, while the data I gathered for this portion of the study was interesting, it wasn't quite as valuable in determining the validity of this type of study. But still, I learned a lot and I did some very unique research that it demonstrated real potential for Instagram as a means of measuring site visitation and ultimately concluded that my study could be modified and applied to many, many other locations around the world at a very low monetary cost. Um, so ultimately, I got exactly what I wanted uh, out of this program. Um, I got to study pro uh, subjects that I enjoy and I got to expand my in intellectual boundaries. I got that Ivy League graduate degree that I wanted on my resume. And um, be because I used my tuition benefits as a Penn employee and spread this out over the course of five years, I did all of this at a very, very manageable cost. Um, so ultimately, this was a wonderful experience. Um, I'm extremely satisfied with how it all turned out. And that's pretty much my, uh, my presentation for you folks. Thanks, Tom. Hey, I, one question comes to me right off the bat. I remember when we first talked about you joining, doing the program, you were saying that because of all the work you were doing with people in the museum, you were getting much more interested in trying to understand the academics behind what they did that was so fascinating, mm -hmm. right? And so you were using that as a reason, like, I got to get back in the classroom because I'm really excited about the research that these um, folks at the museum and their students are doing. Um, so you got into that, and then you were going to bring your background expertise in journalism and um, design 
to help become a better storyteller. So I think it mm -hmm. sounds like with the writing course and all, you did that. But I wonder how do you feel like your capstone and your concentration connects to what you do all day now in the workplace? Um, so that's a good question. Um, I think, well, the, 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 so the program evolved for me, um, throughout, uh, you know, from beginning to end, obviously, because I started working at the museum and part, you know, part of the reason I was, I was, I joined the program was to take, you know, anthropology, archaeology courses with people with whom I was working, um, because I was doing social media at the museum, it made sense for me to understand what they were doing and be able to explain it to, uh, to people, you know, knowing that I had a better sense of what they were doing. Um, and then, uh, things changed, you know, I left the, my job at the museum. And so doing things related to directly related to archaeology and anthropology weren't necessarily, you know, they still interested me, but they weren't quite as important in, in the grand scheme of things for me. Um, and, uh, and things kind of, um, uh, you know, things pop, popped out of the woodwork in uh, surprising ways. Like, um, uh, as I mentioned, um, Chris, you had recommended mapping Philadelphia to me. Um, and I went into that class, you know, just kind of trusting you. Um, and it turned out to be my, my favorite course for the whole, uh, the whole program. Um, I learned so much about Philadelphia history and that included learning about um, uh, the, you know, the, the time when Philadelphia was very young and Wissahickon Park was a brand new, uh, well, you know, for, for those who had um, uh, occupied the city. Uh, was a brand new thing for them, you know, so I, I learned, you know, I, I was introduced to these new resources about Philadelphia history that became perfectly applicable to, uh, to my studies on Wissahickon Park. I ended up, um, for my final project in that course, I made a map, uh, my own map of Wissahickon Valley Park, and that was included in my capstone project as an appendix. Um, so, you know, these little bits and pieces, uh, kind of surprised me along the way. Um, and uh, in terms of what I do now, I mean, I still work very closely with um, digital media. You know, I work with social media on a regular basis. And um, my career has, you know, has included social media as a primary component. And so, you know, doing this um, research with Instagram and figuring out how it can be more than just a tool for, you know, uh, wasting away time and scrolling and looking at pretty pictures it can actually be used for some really robust, um, you know, uh, data mining and, um, you know, information gathering. Uh, and I, you know, I figured that out in a way that um, was really uh, unique research that people hadn't um, really done before. So I was proud of that. And I'm proud of the fact that, uh, again, this is a, this, my project is something that if you just tweak some things, um, you could uh, apply this to all, all kinds of different uh, sites, you know, geographic sites and tourist sites that maybe don't, don't have the money for um, their own on-site surveys uh, and that kind of thing. And this is a really expensive way and apparently a relatively reliable way to, uh, to substitute for that. Awesome, really cool. Well, thanks, Tom. Really appreciate you joining us tonight and sharing a little bit. Good luck Absolutely. with the rest of your evening. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> hey, next, I'm going to introduce Dominic Gaeta. He, Dom finished his MLA this past summer, and his concentration ended up being global politics and society after he took a handful of globalized political science-based courses and wrote his capstone project on post-Cold War nationalism in Germany. Dom currently works for the dental school here at Penn in the Office of Institutional Advancement, working with um, development, alumni relations, and marketing communications. Um, he actually also just helped them finish their accreditation after a long week of uh, 5 a.m. to 8 p.m. day. So Dom's going to go to sleep for the next three days after this, but he was happy to join us um, for some fun, right? Um, in this role at, at the dental school, he works um, primarily develops and releases media content on behalf of the dental school, social media posts, press releases, website updates, and more. Before coming to Penn three years ago, he worked at Widener University and earned his bachelor's in cultural anthropology. In his free time, he enjoys reading, listening to podcasts, spending time outdoors, and traveling to other countries and cities. Aside from Philadelphia, his favorite city is Berlin. Dom, I'm looking forward to hearing you talk about German nationalism in the post-Cold War era. It's all yours. Well, thank you, Dr. Pastor. Um, Tom, it's funny. It sounds like you and I have a very similar background and work life. Um, but thanks again. My name is Dom. Um, I finished the MLA program this past summer. Um, I also wanted to echo a little bit of what Tom said of how uh, academic writing and research design was one of the most critical classes that I took. 
Um, I actually had a friend of mine who was another Penn employee in the MLA program recommend that class to me because she didn't take it. So she had said to me, I totally recommend you taking this class because it, from what I understand, helps people build their capstone project. And that was exactly right. Um, I took it in the fall of 2021. Um, and I had already had this idea of writing about German nationalism in my head um, from a previous class I taught or took with um, Professor Todorov, and it was called um, Nationalism and Ethnic Conflict on Film, which was a wonderful class. So after taking that class, I had developed that idea a little bit, which had also been growing in my head, but that class really had kind of sparked it. And then I was able to take the academic writing and research class with Chris Roberman, who actually ended up being one of my readers, which was wonderful. I learned a lot about not only academic writing, but really how to build this capstone project. Um, I built the research proposal. I came up a lot of the, I came up with a lot of the sources I was going to use. Um, and it really helped me feel confident going into my MLA, like capstone independent study. So unlike Tom, I did not end up taking the forum class because I wanted to finish up this summer because this fall is just really, really busy with work, um, as Dr. Pestor said with our accreditation. Um, so I ended up finishing it over the summer as an independent study, which was kind of tough because it was a 10 weeks instead of 15 weeks during, I think it's 15 weeks during a normal semester, but in the summer I had 10 weeks. Um, and it was great because in the beginning of the program, I, I'm sorry, in the beginning of the semester of the summer, I had met with uh, Chris Roberman and also my other lead reader, Dr. Uh, Dodie Sill, who's wonderful. Uh, we had come up with a plan and they were both very supportive of, you can kind of do what you want to do. Um, just keep us updated and you know we'll provide the feedback, we'll help you where you need. So I ended up submitting two drafts and then my final draft. Um, I spent a lot of time in the library. I ended up taking a lot of time off of work by like literally using PTO to go to the library, which was you know not ideal, but <laughs> it was worth it. And I got a lot done because of doing it. Um, and I was able to submit it with, I think before a day or two before it was two. Um, and it felt amazing to submit because it was something that I had really worked hard on um, the entire summer. So a little bit about my actual like capstone though is um, I wrote my capstone on German nationalism in the post-Cold War era. And the reason I kind of came up with that topic was again, after taking the class with um, Dr. Todorov on nationalism and ethnic conflict on film, but that class primarily focused on like Balkan countries. And it got me wondering a lot um, because of, I'm really interested in history as a whole, but also Germany as a whole uh, with connections to there. So I felt like this is something I should educate myself on. As in, we learn about Germany as Americans, we learn about Germany in a very certain way, but then you kind of stop learning about it after the Cold War, after the uh, fall of the Berlin Wall, depending on where you go to school. But in my case, that's what happened. And I kind of thought, what does nationalism in this country look like today? Because we've only been taught so much about Germany as a whole, of course, most of it is about the war, Nazism, the Holocaust. So I was kind of wondering, how does that still exist today? Because the country itself has taken many steps to distance themselves from the past and also created laws that completely um, you know, outlaw anything related to Nazism. So I also got thinking, how does this kind of relate to at the time what we were seeing in the United States with like the Trump administration? Are there similarities or the differences? So I will share my screen. I don't have a very long PowerPoint, but oops. Okay. Can you see my screen? Okay. All right. So, um, one of the things I was interested in too is uh, one thing I learned about in the one class I took with Dr. Sill, who ended up being one of my readers, was um, what is exactly the post-Cold War era mean? And there are a lot of varying debates on um, what it actually means depending, or depending on who you're talking to. Some scholars say the post-Cold War era is the fall of the Berlin Wall. Some say the post-Cold War era begins with the fall of the USSR. So I was kind of wondering again, this makes perfect sense to me. And I ended up actually writing, um, using the timeline of the fall of the USSR, the Soviet Union, because it felt like it made a little bit more sense to me. Um, 
But it got me wondering, I have not learned anything about this country or nationalism in this country um, through the perspective an Amer as an American after this time era. So that's what kind of got me thinking. Um, I did a lot of research in the class with Dr. Todorov um, about different right-wing groups or different nationalistic groups in, the, in Germany as a whole. And as I started to build my capstone a little bit more in the MLA course, uh, with Chris Roberman, I kind of narrowed it down a little bit to one main political uh, party group that you might kind of, um, you know, depending on your views, you may see eye to eye with, you may see completely against. In that case, I was very much against it, but just my personal views. So the party I ended up focusing on was called the Alternative for Deutschland, but in English, that just means the Alternative for Germany. And essentially what this party is, is they're a far right political group in Germany um, and it is really the first of its kind since the uh, end of World War II. Uh, they're a right-wing populist political party and they're strongly known for their opposition of the European Union, immigration, um, and they're also, uh, they have very vulgar and, what's the right word here? Very, uh, I'm just gonna say gross opinions about Muslims, immigration, and uh, um, basically anybody who's not white. And it may seem like it's not a very popular party, but as I've learned through my research, it has begun to build a lot of support over the past couple of years, um, especially with the COVID pandemic, especially with um, the previous Angela Merkel government and now the Olaf Scholz government, which are both primarily pretty liberal. Um, so it's been kind of growing over the past couple of years with um, average citizens like myself. Um, and then German nationalism is essentially just the idea of the unity or the promotion of the unity of Germans and German speakers into one unified national state, which is essentially what this um, political group is really trying to aim to do. They're trying to unite Germans. Um, they're trying to save their country. They're trying to um, get their country to a point of um, it's more it's Germans or Germany for the Germans is what they'll say. And I also got wondering too, which was a huge part of my project that I apologize I forgot to mention was I was really curious how this group used their propaganda to gain support. Because um, as Dr. Pastor mentioned, one of my favorite cities is Berlin. And um, there's a lot of reasons why I really love Berlin. But one thing that you'll find in Berlin is a lot of signs like this one right here in that I'm, I think my mouse is circling. Um, but it says, wir sind das Volk, which means we are the people. And there's a lot of other ones too, which I'm sorry, I didn't include on this PowerPoint, but there are a lot of propaganda pieces that they include throughout the city at their rallies online, on their website um, that really target uh, Muslims, that really targets culture change um, and insult anybody that's essentially not culturally German. And I was curious, how does this propaganda really compare to the propaganda that the Nazis used during World War II or the build up to World War II from 1933 to the end of it in 1945. Um, and that was really what I focused my capstone on was how does this, these two eras compare to each other? Um, and at first I was thinking, there's no way there's gonna be you know, that much comparison. But as I found out through my research, I was able to find a lot actually. Um, a lot of my paper talks about um, like comparisons between these two different, different artifacts one being from the Nazi era, one being from the current um, AFD era or post-Cold War era. And um, it's concerning. And that's why I felt like my project was very important to talk about because it's a very concerning topic to see things uh, like this in everyday life, especially in a country with such a controversial past. Um, and one thing that also stood out to me too when I was doing my research was a single quote that said, uh, jokes about Jews are becoming funny again. And that was like the one quote that really set off the bells and whistles um, that really made me feel more passionate about this uh, kind of project and this kind of research. It's not the most um, uplifting research, but it was research that I found to be important to educate not only myself, but to educate anybody who is really willing to listen. Um, and again, this was what I was just kind of talking about. I was really interested in comparing um, the two different types of propaganda, or I'm sorry, the two different time eras and their propagandas. So as I was talking about this, uh, the AFD primarily targets Muslims. Um, in English, this really was just, it's 
not an exact translation, but it would essentially mean stop the Islam nation of Germany, even though it doesn't say Germany, it's saying stop the Islam nation. Um, whereas this one down here says, um, if you translate this to English, it goes to Germ uh, Islam does not belong in Germany. And from the Nazi era, there was the, uh, this essentially says in English, he is responsible for the war. Um, and this one says the eternal Jew, which was actually a propaganda film. So of course they're not exact copies and pastes of each other, but the idea was that um, there's two different time periods, two different parties, but they're both focusing and singling out what they view as the enemy of the state. So of course in the Nazi era, it was the Jews, but now it's the Muslims. Um, and one thing that I learned that the AFD really does to gain support is through these propaganda pieces to really scare Germans into believing that this is what their country is going to turn into. This is what their women will end up wearing. Uh, their daughters or their uh, wives or sisters or mothers won't be safe because of the migrants. Um, and you'll see a total culture change. Um, and then they think that their country will end up um, a primarily Islamic country. Um, and another thing too that they were talking about a lot, or I'm sorry, that my research talks about a lot was, um, you know, how, like, how does this, uh, why is this so important? And um, that was, again, I, I know I just said that, but I found it very important because um, it's concerning. It's very concerning. So not the most uplifting research, I know. Um, but it was something that I just felt very passionate about. Um, I wanted to do a lot of research on, and I felt like I learned a lot, um, especially with my connections to the country. So I felt not more connected, but more informed, um, especially because I don't live there primarily. Um, you know, I go there a lot, but I don't live there primarily. Um, but yeah, that is essentially what my research was on. Um, it was very tough, but it was very interesting. Um, I like Tom really enjoyed my experience. Um, I really enjoyed also taking advantage of the tuition benefit that Penn offers um, and earning a Penn degree. Um, that was something I never, as an 18 year old, I never would have taught myself doing as, you know, now I'm older, but when I was 18, I never saw myself getting to this point. So also a huge source of pride for me. Um, but yeah, that is essentially my project. Thanks, Tom. Yeah, one of the things I Thank wonder you. about, like the AFD and some of the other far right parties that are not just in Germany, I think um, Swedish and Danish elections just had um, a tremendous showing on the far right, which is also mm -hmm. concerning. Um, but I wonder, you know, and, and I think there was a Ian, um, one of our other speakers posted in the chat about how similar this might be to MAGA in the US. But the general consensus that mm -hmm. many populist movements, especially populist movements on the right, are mm -hmm. oftentimes an effort to harness a voting block to, to get power um, and to convince people to vote sort of against their own interests by frightening them. And you pointed out mm -hmm. this effort to create fear amongst Germans that their society is going to change. But the upside, and what is the upside? Is it that they, um, the party leaders or other individuals, and you know, which one of the contentions we face in the US, are trying to get people to vote based on fear, so support economic policies which are not in their best interests that benefit other folks who just then can disguise their motivations and their, their reasoning for, for certain kinds of policy initiatives. And I often wondered um, in, a, in a country like Germany and other countries in Europe that, that you know, were much, you know, everyone was involved in the Second World War and then Cold War, mm -hmm. you know, global phenomenon, but the, the physical destruction and the loss of history and the, the death toll was so out, um, outlandish that um, the effort to figure out at what point do right-wing populist movements start to grow and get enough traction with that history sort of staring them in the face? And at what point is there enough distance, um, mm -hmm. you know, in, in regard? Yeah. What do you think about so, um, some of that? Well, it's funny you should mention that because I have in my paper a little bit um, in my background section, I wrote a little bit about how after the uh, Cold War had officially ended, there were several right-wing parties that tried to enter the political arena, but they all failed miserably. Um, and then they kind of died down a little bit. Um, and then with the COVID-19 era, and then the uh, mass um, influx of refugees in 2015, when the uh, 
the presence of Islam or people who are not white or people who are not born and raised in Germany or speak German uh, became prevalent and relevant and you would see them and they're visible. Um, I think that's really when the people on the right or these populist parties really saw an opportunity to take advantage of the current situation that they were facing. Um, and I think that is what, of course, led to the preying on, but also what led to the support. Um, of course, like I just said, you're seeing all these new different things, which gets these people to think something's changing. And if you don't like change, I don't like change. Um, I can vote for this party because they have my best interests in mind, um, which was, yeah, it's concerning, in my opinion. Yeah. Yeah. But I think the fascination with doing this research and learning more about a place that you love um, and, mm -hmm. and how it may be coming under some threat and what are mm -hmm. uh, opportunities to move forward and open dialogue up and, and make people recognize some of these dangers um, mm -hmm. and, and what are the best paths forward is a great way to use what you've learned. So uh, that, that could be something that could be rewarding down the road for you as well. Thanks yeah, so much. Absolutely. Thank I you. Appreciate it. Okay, our next speaker is Jordan Pascucci. And she serves as Senior Associate Dean Depu and Deputy Director of Admissions at Penn, where she previously spent a decade as Associate Dean and Regional Director working with the global applicants. She came back to Penn in 2020 after four years in secondary school leadership. Um, Jordan oversaw admissions, financial aid, strategic planning, and marketing as Director of Enrollment Management and Strategic Initiatives at the George School. Prior to her work as George School, she was Co-Director of College Counseling and Director of Institutional Research at the Baldwin School. Her varied roles in secondary ed and higher ed have shaped her perspective on the college admissions process. She earned her BA from Temple and now her MLA from the University of Pennsylvania with a concentration in American Studies, a Certificate in Gender and Sexuality Studies, and her capstone is Outside the Box, LGBTQ Identity and College Admissions. Jordan. Yeah, I'm really excited. Um, this work has been so personal to me and it's just been such a journey. I did my undergraduate and I was a double major in political science and American studies. And so when I first came to Penn and learned about the MLA program and the opportunity to really still continue that idea of exploring what identity means um, in America, it was so wonderful. And I am so grateful to the <laughs> huge range of courses that contributed to ultimately me being able to form a capstone, but have so much growth along the way. My first class was um, Colloquium in American History, Antebellum, Anti-Slavery. And there we actually focused on Black abolitionists. And it opened my eyes to the idea of identity's relationship to agency and how could we tell our story if we're not seen? And so I focused in that class on black female abolitionists and I worked with the Female Anti-Slavery Society, the Philadelphia Historical Society and kind of got that idea of how do you incorporate different sources. Um, I then had, it was a two part, so it, it was two classes. It was Museum Methods Curatorial Seminar where we, <laughs> put on an exhibition at the Arthur Ross Gallery, focusing on the interiors and the furniture of Louis Kahn. And we met members of the Kahn family. We had to deal with the press. We had to deal with everything from how do you, how do you get objects on loan? How do you work with historic artifacts? To how do you then market it, tell the story, carry all of these different materials because you never knew what you were gonna end up with at the end of the day into one kind of cohesive story. And that was such an extraordinary, it was such a small class, I think there were only eight of us and it was so special. Um, women in incarceration um, was something that was cross-listed between the MLA program and nursing. And we went weekly to inmates at the Riverside Correctional Facility where the women there were our classmates. And it, completely opened my perspective and I was able to do a project looking at the systemic issues related to the experience of LGBTQ inmates. I came across um, a, all of these different organizations that did letter writing between LGBTQ people who were incarcerated and, uh, and people who were not incarcerated to sort of 
say that very early, you know, you, you're seen, you're, you belong. And so that idea of like, how do you keep someone safe while showing them that they belong was of interest to me because these letter writing campaigns also didn't want to out anyone. Um, so it was a very interesting, it, it ultimately tied in then to what I did later on. Um, I took a great class literary representations of nature and society where I, I think my final project was how Galileo influenced Shakespeare, reminding me yet again that, um, you know, the, the interconnectedness between things and how we influence each other is, is a powerful thing. Um, I took that at the same time actually that I did a media and religion of India course that looked at Bollywood and Indian cinema. I had no idea how ripe it was with symbolism. Um, so kind of understanding that symbols, symbols matter uh, and they, they communicate great things. And then um, of course, as I was nearing the end and my professional interests were also taking off, it made sense to step into the history of American higher education class that was offered through the Graduate School of Education to start to more broadly look at the systemic issues that had shaped higher ed. Um, I did an independent study then to start to try to pull all of this together <laughs> um, using the lens of Penn admissions, which is something I'll talk about in a second. And I had a significant gap, I'll just say, I'll just put it that way, in between when I began my coursework and then coming back to wrap it up. But uh, I was able to take a course with Kitsy Watterson, who someone else also mentioned, that was actually a memoir writing workshop. And it was the experience of kind of trying to tell my own story that helped me understand the true value in allowing people to express their identity and how important that is for everyone. So all of that led to my capstone work, which I'm going to talk through, and I really only have three slides to just orient people to the common application and some data that's important to understand with this that I'll just pull up at different times. But otherwise, I'm just going to kind of um, talk through this because it's, it's kind of an interesting puzzle. And what I chose for my capstone was is LGBTQ identity and the college admissions process because the common application, the coalition application, the major platforms that exist for students to apply to college do not currently include the option for students to disclose affiliation with LGBT community. And it's an interesting thing because this the advocacy to include that has been going on for some time. So I focus specifically on the efforts between 2010 and today to encourage uh, the major platform of the common application to get involved and to do something and to respond to applicants and, and allowing students to express their full identities through the application. And the time of 2010 to today um, is, is kind of when this all really took off. And part of that is because the common application, for those who don't know, it began in, in, the, you know, in, in, the, in 1975 with only 15 institutions. And today it has over 900 members and serves over 1 million students who apply to college every year. And so it, it got big really fast. Um, in 2010, um, the University of Pennsylvania was one of the first universities in the nation to start to intentionally try to connect with LGBTQ applicants. And because of that work, because of that interest, Penn early on got involved in trying to encourage the Common App to change its platform. So in my capstone, I dabbled into the rationale of common application, but there's really just so many pieces of this that can be dug into much, much more. Um, the, the University of Pennsylvania is kind of the nice framework because Penn decided to take action on its own when the common app did not. So 
Essentially, while the Common App began as an effort to simplify the college process so that students could submit it and it could go to any institution that accepted it, it quickly became a very complex thing. <laughs> and in the early 2000s, it experienced exponential growth. And because of that, because it went from, you know, less than 100 institutions to 500 seemingly overnight, it needed to develop policies and processes in order to manage a very complex process on behalf of hundreds of very different institutions. And so the common application had a set of standard questions that it asked on its mainframe and then allowed all of its member institutions to have supplemental questions that they asked. And the supplemental questions had to go through an approval process and still do today. Um, and this approval process was to prevent duplicate questions from being asked. So it was sold as keeping the integrity of the common application so that students weren't having to answer the same question over and over again, so that they got sign off on anything that an institution wanted to put on their supplement. So the University of Pennsylvania joined the common app in 2007 and experienced pretty quickly that this process wasn't always taking all of the nuances or interests of each institution into consideration. Penn, for example, has a unique financial aid policy that extends its need blind policy um, to residents and citizens of Canada and Mexico. So Penn had a need to get more information about citizenship from students. And the Common App needed justification because it, at first it was seeing that as a duplicate of its citizenship question. Penn also at the same time started to advocate for non-binary identity, gender identity, and also the inclusion of sexual orientation. The common application um, turned down its request for gender identity, saying at the time that it was a duplicate of its question about sex. And I'm gonna share my screen for a second because one of the problems here is that sex and gender are different. And um, sex is the only thing that was um, being asked by the common application. So from the common application inception all the way until the year 2016, the common application only asked this question up here, female, male. And it did not ask specifically sex, it did not ask specifically gender, and it had no option beyond the binary. But one of the things that got cut off, unfortunately, at the bottom is that it did ask your religious preference, it did ask your military status, it did ask your marital status, and it asked if you had children. And so there was an awful lot of things that were quite personal that it was asking um, at the time. And so the common application after the University of Pennsylvania kept advocating for this change, finally said, we'll send a survey out to the members. And Penn then engaged in advocacy to the membership to try to get everybody to fill it out. Unfortunately, in 2011, the common application came back and said that it was not going to take up the issue at the time. And it cited at the time, its executive director listed, would, would students would feel too much pressure to answer. Students would worry about how this is used. Students would worry about access. Students would worry that a negative decision is part was a result of how they answered this question. Um, at the same time though, uh, there were also, you know, on the flip side, it was kind of like, well, we ask a lot of questions at admissions. So why wouldn't we ask about this too? And a lot of the kind of logic that was, that Common Up was using to explain why it wasn't taking up the issue at the time really could have been applied to any question on the, you know, the application. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of sensitive information. And so why wouldn't we want to have the most accurate information available on anyone who's actually attending or applying? At the same time that all of this was happening, there were, um, you know, some colleges and universities who didn't use the common application that started to ask this question. Elmhurst University, formerly Elmhurst College, um, actually was the first and then 
that was in 2011. And then a year later, the University of Iowa actually became the first public university to ask about LGBTQ community on its application. And both referenced just that they wanted to send the signal of valuing student identity, but also the really important issue of being able to connect students with resources sooner so that they could help them with the transition to college and help them succeed. And so another criticism that started to come out was that the question was deemed inappropriate for high school students since they were unlikely to understand their sexuality. Also, however, this was overlooking the idea that connecting students with resources was important and could be a benefit to their success in college, but also it contradicted data that was coming out from national organizations like GLSEN, which is the Gay and Lesbian Straight Educators, Gay, Lesbian and Straight Educators Network that oversees um, gender and sexuality alliances or otherwise known as GSA clubs in high schools around the country. All of their data was showing that there was a big increase in students not only joining these clubs, but the, it had been, I think it, it, it doubled in five years, the number of DSAs that were actually registered in the nation. And so it was, there, there was just a generational difference here. Penn actually started engaging in active recruitment by attending um, LGBT college fairs that were put on by an organization called Campus Pride, and then also doing its own outreach through local LGBT community centers in different cities, as well as other organizations and GSA chapters. Um, so Penn's internal solution was to start to tag students um, as admissions officers read files. And Penn launched this in 2010 and has now, you know, 12 years of data, right? And one of the beautiful things, um, I'll show the data in a second, but it tells a story that it's only moments of systemic change that really lead to, to, to impact. Right, that it's it's really that any institution could try as hard as they want at trying to find and capture and read between the lines of like the information students are sharing. But it's so important to explicitly ask and explicitly invite students to share who they are if you really want to know. Um, and so I will show this real quickly. And again, it's it's a huge takeaway, really, is just that. No matter what we did in those early years, um, until you actually asked students the question, they were not going to read into other parts of the application as invitations to share more about themselves than you asked. And that's true not just for LGBT identity, but also for anything really. Um, and so let me just quickly share this before I wrap up. Okay. So you can see here kind of over time, right, is that we start out, we train staff in 2010. And one of the big important things here is that this is information in the early years is only capturing students that are likely to be admitted because this amount of time and scrutiny wasn't going to be spent on thousands and thousands of applicants, right, that, that weren't going to be admitted. So it's grossly underreporting, right? But then you can see that um, Penn, in, to, in the, the jump there at the end of 2016, that's the first admission cycle that Penn added to its supplement. Would you like to share identity with the LGBTQ community in your application? And students had the option to just select yes, no, or and then tell you more if they wanted to, or just leave it at that. And you just see the huge jump there. And so the, the thing is, is that these students were there all along. And so just think about the years and the hundreds or thousands of students that went by unseen and unconnected then with the campus LGBT center, with phenomenal resources, with advising notes, with all kinds of things that could have really helped welcome them um, and then set them up for success sooner. And so all of this to say that, you know, at the end of the day, while this project started as something that was focused on the question around LGBTQ identity, the learning, I think, has much broader implications um, because part of it, it, I had a conversation, you know, with Common Application as part of wrapping up this project, and they still said, 
the same things. You know, we need to know that organization or institutions and universities can protect the data. We need to know that institutions wouldn't discriminate against applicants because of their answer. We need to know that they could protect this data. But shouldn't institutions be able to protect all of the data that they're receiving from applications and shouldn't they be able to in ensure non-discrimination about any of the information they're receiving and one of the people who we've been working with through all of this advocacy has been campus pride and i spoke with its executive director who i just want to read this quote because i think is just so important students have intersectional identities it's not just race or socioeconomic status by not asking about LGBTQ identity, colleges are failing to do their retention work. The safer a student feels, the better they perform. And you can't create a safe space without asking about LGBTQ intersection. We know there are higher instances of substance abuse, mental health needs, suicide. And if we knew this about any other population, not only would we wanna know who they were, they would be pro there would be proactive programs designed to help them transition to college. And so it's kind of this takeaway of, it's not about asking this specific question, but can we come to an agreement that applicants deserve context around what they're being asked on the application and why in all instances? And could that be a way that we step forward to move to incorporate this into applications as a norm? Um, so I will pause there, but it's been a really, really exciting, powerful journey just to continue this work uh, around identity. And so I'm actually here at a conference where I hope I'll be able to have some conversations that we could actually get this to happen. Super. Yeah, Jordan's joining us from Houston. So she had a leg in her schedule and said she could, she could jump on and share with her work. And it was really fun to work with Jordan over the years and help her in the first phase and then help her get back in the, the swing of things and figure out how to do it in part two and, and seal the deal, but not just seal the deal in, in a rote fashion, but to do something that connected to what ways you wanna impact Penn and impact admissions, impact your community uh, and learn. So it was really a lot of fun to, to help her along the way. I really enjoyed and appreciate her getting on here. And I have to say that the admissions process, I'm in the third year in a row of having to deal with admissions here in my kitchen. Um, and the, the big question about how do students tell people what they're all about? They're, they're nervous, they're young, they're reading between the lines, wondering what a reader is gonna take away from that. And knowing that the school will wanna meet you halfway and find out more about who you are and how you'll fit into the community. And you know, hearing from everybody here tonight so far, we're talking a lot about how Penn and, um, is a community and the MLA is a really rich opportunity to be involved in that community of learners and, and scholars. Being able to understand more about that, I think is, is the best way to make sure that you can set students up for success. I think that's really a, you know, a great way for you to, to think about moving forward and connecting what you learned um, and how you learned to, you know, be able to tell people who you are in that memoir class and how important that is, um, you know, and have what you did in the classroom connect to what you do in your day job. Really exciting. Thanks. Um, our next speaker is Ian Jacobs. He was one of the first pediatric otolaryngology fellows at CHOP back in 1991. And then he spent five years at Emory University School of Medicine but then he was recruited to return to CHOP and he launched the Center for Pediatric Airway Disorders. The center is now a world-renowned clinical and research-driven pediatric center focusing on new treatments and defining clinical pathways for pediatric airway disorders. Among his other accomplishments, he's developed a well-regarded annual pediatric airway course, which is a model for other institutions in Europe and the U.S. He's collaborated with scientists at Penn um, and created an award-winning trilogic thesis, pediatric laryngo tracheal reconstruction with tissue engineered cartilage in a rabbit model. Partly because of these efforts, his airway program was recently awarded a multi-million dollar grant through CHOP's Frontier Program to promote clinical and translational research. He's had leadership roles at a national level in the ABAA and ASPO, and he's making a tremendous impact in the world of pediatric otolaryngology. For fun, he's done 200 triathlons. He also loves to fish, catches every game he can, eagles, even fillies, travels and yep, took courses in the MLA. And I remember when he was interviewing with me, I think his daughters were undergrads at Penn and he wanted to race into the finish. And he wanted to be part of the Penn student community as well. 
He's fresh off, I think, surgery today. He's going to speak to us about his MLA capstone. Mm -hmm. You can see behind me the 1779, where am I pointing here? I'm backwards, sorry. He wrote about the development of Benjamin Franklin's proposals for educational reform and their impact on the academy and charitable school at the College of Philadelphia in the late 18th century. So Ian's going to talk a little bit about where we came from. It's all yours, Ian. Thank you, Chris. Um, can you enable me to share screen? <clears throat> I'm not sure I see that function. You, but I mean, this was a phenomenal opportunity. Yeah, go to what? Um, all hosts and panels should be able to share. So go down and, um, and float around towards the bottom or the top of your Zoom screen and see if the menu pops up. No. I'm let me see. I know you sent me your slides. So let me go out of full screen and see if I can. Do you want me to share for you? Yeah, that would be great. I've had okay. trouble, you know, with Zoom because they've limited Zoom at, at, at my work institution um, for security reasons. We do yeah. Teams. Hold and on, let, me, um, let me pull up your blue uh, jeans. And I'll just have you advance when. But again, this was an incredible opportunity to, to work at Penn, to work at CHOP, to have sort of an outlet for studying, you know, things outside of science and medicine, um, which I didn't have at my former institution, to be able to interact with other students and faculty. It was just a phenomenal, um, a phenomenal opportunity. And I enjoyed many of the classes I, I took. Uh, I can't say it directly uh, impacts my career, except, um, and can you do a slideshow? Um, yeah, is it, can you guys see the share? Yeah, I can see it. Okay. Okay, do you want me to advance? Um, I'm not seeing it now. There. Can you click on slideshow? Okay. Does everybody see that? Okay. There you go. Okay, perfect. Um, so I, I, I did this over a long run. I think I was probably one of Chris's um, longest tenure students. I think I started taking classes shortly after I came back to Penn as a faculty in 1997. I think my first class was maybe in 2000 and something like that. And I slowly took classes probably one a year. I mean, my time was limited with that. <clears throat> and I came into the MLA program about eight or nine years ago. And I took some fascinating courses with um, a number of great faculty, including American fiction, creative writing, urban studies, which I really enjoyed um, with mapping Philadelphia to courses on history, healthcare policy and artificial intelligence. So it was really a great way to, to expand my boundaries and, and just to learn a lot. And I became very interested in the history uh, through, through my mapping history, uh, mapping Philadelphia course on the history of Philadelphia some of the institutions here, like um, the American Philosophical Society, the university, um, and other things that really were started in this great city. And I wanted to kind of focus in on Benjamin Franklin, who was a real, you know, he's probably the most impactful person that I can think of when I think about Philadelphia. Um, so I, um, I did this thesis and did a lot of um, primary research on Ben. Next slide. And uh, really to, to really get into what, um, how Ben Franklin influenced Philadelphia, you really have to look, go back to his early life. He was born in Puritan, Boston, where he um, lived in a very strict uh, Puritan society uh, and was born in 1706. He attended Boston Latin School for a few years uh, with the intention of going to Harvard. And at that time, the colonial schools that were in existence, Harvard, Yale, William and Mary, were pretty much schools that had one function, just to educate clergy. Um, there, there was no such thing as liberal arts or, or professional education at all. And a lot of this 
you know, I was really amazed in my research how much of this was really started uh, here in Philadelphia at Penn. Um, so Benjamin Franklin apprenticed um, for a while. His father stopped his education at age 10 because he didn't seem cut out to be a clergy. And that's all really his father wanted him to do. So he apprenticed in his father's candle shop for a while. He was extremely bored. His father then uh, brought him to his brother's printing shop which he sort of enjoyed. And at that time he had the opportunity to learn, to read books and to really, and to write for a New England paper that his brother had started called the New England Current. And he wrote what was called the Dogwood Papers under the, under the uh, pseudonym of Silence Dogwood. Um, and he s satirized a lot of the Puritan life and uh, problems with Harvard um, at the time, but he, his brother uh, seemed to have great control over the paper. He limited his power and he left after a personal dispute with his brother um, at age 17. He um, um, purchased a ticket and sailed for New York on Long Island Sound. And he wound up in New York City. He looked around for work and was unable to find work. So he set out on foot and walked across the state of New Jersey to the Camden area and he took a boat across the Delaware River to Philadelphia, arriving on an October morning in 1723. Next slide. Um, he immediately got to work. I mean, this guy was in a city now that had more opportunities, was more wide open, more accepting, and he started working in the printing industry. He um, apprenticed with a number of printers and eventually built up his own printing business. But this was not it. I mean, he, he, he did multiple things. He was a true um, Renaissance man. So he started a self-help group known as the Junto Club in 1727. And he would meet every Friday night um, over drinks and wine and, and talk about various things from education to improving urban life economic issues, and he started the self-help group. Now this group formalized into the American Philosophical Society, which he founded in 1743 with a headquarters um, in Center City. And this, the APS still exists today. And, and I, I get frequent emails from them and invited to certain talks and, and, and functions. Um, he was also an avid and voracious reader, and he founded the Free Library Society of Philadelphia in 1731. And Benjamin retired as a printer at age 42 because he made enough money to um, focus on things that he loved, politics, science, uh, you know, inventions, electricity, and next slide. He was also highly interested in education. So um, as he once uh, wisely said, an investment in knowledge pays the best interest. Next slide. So in uh, as early as 1743 in his, in his autobiography, he alluded to um, some of his interest in starting an academy in Philadelphia that would enable the youth in Philadelphia to get uh, a more liberal and wide, um, um, wide ranging education as opposed to just the clergy education or uh, religious education that was available in other colonies. Um, but uh, other things were going on in the country. There was um, um, some revolutionary st uh, stirrings. There was uh, economic issues. So he put this off to 1749, where he uh, published the treatise on a proposal for the Academy in Philadelphia, which was a very dense document with many quotations from, from Milton. Next slide. Um, and the major points of the proposals were that education should be taught that something that is useful as well as things that are ornamental. So really to be more practical. Um, and he thought that while most schools and most uh, uh, secondary education emphasize classical learning, he thought English was the most important learning to communicate in your primary language through public speaking, grammar, rather than classics or foreign languages. So he really thought English was, this was his most important thing um, in, the, uh, in the proposals that he thought about. And he emphasized practical rather than classical education. And in addition, he wrote about the need to educate people on geography, comparative anthropology, morality, oratory, print, 
religion, rhetoric, modern history, agriculture, trade and commerce, technology, natural philosophy, and science. So it sounds like the university of the future. He was well ahead of his time. Next slide. Well, what influenced Franklin? Because he was in Boston where nothing was accepted except the you know, religious education. Um, he was in a much more open-minded city, religiously tolerant, um, culturally diverse, many different types of immigrants. So it was much more open-minded and right and ready for a new type of education. He was also inf influenced by certain British philosophers like Francis Bacon, John Locke, who, who emphasized empirical thinking, practical thinking, rather than the uh, classics. And particularly his time in Scotland where he spent time with David Hume um, was very influential. Scotland was sort of um, an out of the box type of situation, very different than than England and, and, and Britain. And um, he was very highly influenced by a number of Scottish um, uh, people, uh, including making his first pro provost. Um, provost Smith uh, was, was an immigrant from Scotland. Next slide. Well, one question I have is when we talk about when Penn was founded, 1740 is on every banner and t-shirt in the bookstore. Well, Penn was, was not really founded in 1740. Penn was founded in really the first paperwork for the Academy was in 1749, officially published. And the first trustee meeting that sort of okayed this and, and, and certified the Academy was in 1749 and late in that year in December. But 1740 was when George Whitfield, the, the evangelist from, from Georgia, from Savannah, Georgia, came up and wanted to start a preaching hall in Philadelphia. So he, he erected this building on 4th and Arch Street and he worked there um, preaching to the populace on um, religious matters. And he left after about seven, eight years and Franklin became really interested in this space when he was thinking about his school in 1749, 1750. So he acquired the, the property for a very, very um, um, cheap uh, amount. Next slide. And he refurbished it, added books and turned it into a school. Well, the questions we're thinking about is Franklin had these very specific goals, English school, diverse education, commerce, things like that. And when, we, when I was doing my research, I was thinking about my main points of focus and looking at the primary resources, secondary resources and textbooks. So did Franklin, um, what influenced his decisions to do what he did? What social and cultural aspects of Philadelphia impacted him? and what aspects of his proposals were accepted by Philadelphia and what were rejected? And was he successful overall in achieving his goals? Because this was one of his most complex endeavors that he did compared to the Philosophical Society or the Free Library. Next slide. Well, he hired, he recruited Provost Smith who wrote about the general ideas of the College of Morania, a book, uh, emphasizing education for citizenship and for um, you know practical matters, and he really liked that. So he recruited Pro uh, uh, Smith from from Scotland, who had, uh, initially came out to Long Island to live, and then he he became the first provost of the first academic officer of the university of of the college, um, and that was in 1755 when the Academy and Charitable School of Philadelphia actually became a college. Next slide. Well, what happened? Provost Smith started to push back because he was still a classist. He was still, you know, a strong classics uh, a stalwart. So he uh, gave him push back. And as early as the very first trustee meeting on November 13th, the board of trustees who were major um, people, um, stakeholders in Philadelphia wanted to emphasize Latin, Greek and classical education as opposed to what Franklin wanted. So they elected to split the school into an English school and then a Latin and Greek school. So there were three schools and the trustees gave the title of rector to the Latin master and no title at all to the English master. And this really disappointed Franklin. 
Um, the trustees failed to support the English school to the extent of the classics and, and Latin school. And they gave half the salary to the, um, to the master. And uh, later on, when the uh, master of the English school uh, resigned for health reasons, he was never replaced. And uh, later on, years later, after the founding of the College of Philadelphia in 1756, Franklin was away a lot on diplomatic missions overseas, and he was replaced as a, on the board of trustees, as the head of the board of trustees at, at a May 19, 50, 1756 board meeting. Next slide. So the substantial, um, and this is just sort of a timeline of all the events that took place that led up to the buildup of the University of Pennsylvania. I mean, he first alludes to this concept in his autobiography, but does nothing about it in 1743. He officially publishes the proposals in 1749. The first classes begin in 1751 in January, first graduation in 54, officially starts at the college. So this is the first time that it initially begin, uh, begins as a, as a high school, really, as a, as a uh, a pre-college school and then the college that grants bachelor's degree starts in 1755. Um, he also, there's two gentlemen, John, uh, John Morgan and William Shippen who go to Scotland and Edinburgh and they study medicine, they come back and they petition to form a medical school in 1765. Uh, things continue to accelerate. Um, the university gets incorporated in uh, to a state school uh, building the college, the medical school uh, together in 1779 and officially becomes the University of Pennsylvania in 1791. At that time, Franklin is made the, um, uh, in 1791, the head of the trustees again and, um, uh, and Smith gets demoted to just the head of the college. Uh, and then other things happen. The School of Mines, Arts and Manufacturing gets founded in 1852. That's the pre precursor to the engineering school and technology, and then in 1881, the first business school in America. Next slide. So in, in terms of what Franklin thought, I did a lot of primary research on some of his documents in his autobiography, and he, he um, was excited about the school. He was very proud of it. But again, he was immensely disappointed with the shortcomings, especially the English school, and his battles over stakeholders, including Provost Smith, um, and he reflects this in one of his personal documents in 1789, one year before his death. Um, and he, he writes, quote, this has dwindled into a school similar to those kept by old women who teach their children letters. Uh, I seem here to be surrounded by the ghosts of my dear departed friends beckoning and urging me to use only the, the only tongue now left us in demanding that justice to our grandchildren, that to our children has been denied. So he's really disappointed that the, you know, he feel like he, he's a failure. Next slide. But, you know, the, all these great things happen. John Morgan and Shippen developed the medical school, the first medical department in North America. You get the University of the State of Pennsylvania in 1779, right behind you, Chris, first university in America. This is a revolutionary concept. I mean, the, the, they were just colleges back then. And then the University of Pennsylvania in 1791. So after, after Franklin's demise, he achieves the ultimate success. Next slide. Leading to the most, you know, the first liberal arts education in America, the first university in America, the first medical school. This was very revolutionary and so much more than just the Latin classics and the English school. So it, it, it had a life of its own and continued to take, take off. And next, next slide. And my thought questions are, did Franklin ultimately achieve his goals, even though the English school didn't become the main focus? It was a great English department now. And what, um, and how was he influenced in the school, both from European influences and those influences that were uniquely American? These are just thought questions. And the most interesting question is, would Franklin be proud of what Penn is today? Um, and again, I, I learned so much about Philadelphia from my research. I learned so much about the university. I really didn't know that, you know, some of the firsts that, that had taken place. And of course, some of the um, geography, uh, Fourth and Arch Street, the original campus, and um, the transformation to West Philadelphia. Again, taking these classes, this was just a great opportunity. I enjoyed my time and I continue to 
take classes on and off at the university. And I'll be open for any questions. Thank you. Thanks, Ian. Yeah, it's really fun to sort of do a sort of walk through someone's brain that's like as, as a multi-talented and multi-valent personality as Franklin. Um, but I also think it's fun that in the process, you also looked at this and, and his own sort of self-conscious recognition of what whether his enterprise is a success or a failure. And the fact that many of the successes of the institution really come after he's, his, he's passed and we don't, and you know, he thought he, he left something that was a shadow um, and, and a very weak shadow of an idea he had, you know, flickering in the dim candlelight because these other fools in the board of trustees mm -hmm. didn't understand where they could go. Um, and, you know, having um, an opportunity to know some of the folks who have been on the board of trustees here at Penn, I, we had one do the MLA, um, another one do the MLA, uh, you know, uh, heading up some of the boards here at Penn. Mm -hmm. So meeting people and thinking about how universities govern themselves and what uh, initiatives get pursued and what don't. Um, thinking about things like, you know, Jordan, what another organization will or won't let you do and what their motivation is and what their explanation is and how it fall, sometimes, you know, just doesn't ring true. We learn a lot about ourselves when we do research, when we take different courses and we get out there and try new things. It's really pretty fascinating. So, you know, I'm really glad that everybody that presented tonight, but that's had been in the MLA for the past, you know, 25, 30 years has had a chance to find a project that really has meaning for them and, and learn a little bit and, and get out there and try something new. You know, Franklin and the history of the University of Pennsylvania is really also kind of fascinating in the sense that um, the, the effort to break the shackles in, in the colonies, at least, of clerical education and create an opportunity for a, a chance to study not new things, but topics that generally were subordinate in many instances connecting more closely to trade and other things as opposed to high-minded intellectual pursuits, um, you know, fascinates me as well because my background in, in studying Italian Renaissance, one of the things I did as a student of historic landscapes, since I studied the Venetian um, elite and their patronage of new properties in the mainland was the recognition of the, a dramatic difference in what members of the Venetian noble uh, and upper classes did in terms of education because they basically pursued their education all at the University of Padua which was similar to the University of Pennsylvania, the university was not a seminary, not a religious school. It was basically a home base for the study of natural philosophy, which at the time was really high science. First botanical garden in Europe is in the is Ur Botanico in Padova. So similar things, this enterprise to understand the world uh, and do different things may very well only happen because the educational enterprise is connected with policymakers. And policymakers actually oftentimes drive not just politics, they drive culture um, because of their position in society. Uh, so studying Franklin and history of the University of Pennsylvania is kind of an interesting place to think about why Philadelphia is different from other cities on the East Coast and in the US um, and cities in the modern world. Uh, and I think Penn's allowed us a lot of latitude um, in the MLA program to keep that alive, to go and study new things and to let people do it at their own pace, to come in not really knowing what they want to study, but they want to get back in the classroom. And then as they change over three, five years, or even one year from their application essay to what they write their cast on, they may not really look like the same student, but that's because they turn themselves into the student they really wanted to be. Uh, so I think it's, it's, it's cool to be able to celebrate that every year with this capstone forum um, and hear about some of the exciting work that people do and, and share with other folks. Um, I didn't see any questions in the Q&A, Lizzie, that had come up. There were some things back and forth in the chat, which were good. Um, does anybody want to um, ask any final questions before we close down for the night and, and thank our presenters? Let me look, check the Q&A one last time. Nothing open. Well, great. All right. Well, thanks again for a really fun evening. Um, really cool to see some uh, friendly faces. Um, from different parts of uh, my career here at Penn, um, but who have all finished really strong in the last couple of years. Thanks for sharing with us. And uh, it was a great forum again. Thanks, Ian. Thanks, Jordan. Thanks, Tom. I'll email Tom. Thanks. He's, uh, he's on baby duty, I think, right now as we speak. So we'll all go home and get a nice night's sleep and he won't. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> Thank have you, guys. Thanks, Chris. See ya.